Mario's tanuki suit was inspired by a real animal native to Japan, but the folktales that exist about this animal are an equal mix of pee your pants hilarious and truly disturbing. You've been warned. What is going on everybody? My name is John Solo, and if you haven't seen the Super Mario movie yet, do yourself a favor and buy tickets immediately preferably for a showing that's after bedtime. The last thing you want when watching a kid's movie in theaters is for kids to actually be there. What? Mommy, mommy, that's Mario. Yeah, we know, Derek, it's the Mario movie. While I swear this episode wasn't sponsored by the Mushroom Kingdom, it's sponsored by Squarespace, but more on them later, I genuinely can't recommend this movie enough to longtime fans of the Mario franchise. It's not gonna leave you emotionally wrecked like a Disney or Pixar movie, which is apparently the only kind of animated film that critics on Rotten Tomatoes think should exist, but it's fun, funny, and absolutely full of Easter eggs referencing the many adventures Mario's had over his illustrious career. I don't wanna give too much away because while the story isn't anything revolutionary, I just think it's best to go into all movies with as little info as possible. But what I will tell you is that Mario's beloved Tanuki suit does make an appearance, and it's used in spectacular fashion. Now for those wondering why Mario would wear the skin of a raccoon, this actually isn't anything new. The Tanuki suit, which is named for the raccoon dog native to Japan, made its first appearance in Super Mario Bros. 3, which was released in Japan on October 23rd, 1988. While wearing the Tanuki suit, Mario could spin attack with his tail, fly for brief periods of time, and even transform himself into an invincible stone statue. And though some of those abilities may sound random for a raccoon, they're all rooted in Tanuki folklore. So before we get into the surreal stories that have been told about Tanukis for the past thousand plus years, I want to tell you more about the truly ridiculous role they tend to play in folklore, as well as one of the superpowers that some of you are really going to wish Nintendo included in the Mario franchise. As I mentioned a minute ago, Tanukis are raccoon dogs that are native to Japan. It's important to specify where they're from because there's also the Chinese raccoon dog, which I was surprised to learn is considered a different species entirely and has no no folklore behind it. It's also important we establish that the way Tanuki is spelled in Mario, T-A-N-O-O-K-I, is different than the real life spelling, T-A-N-U-K-I, though I do think the double O is more fun. Lastly, you should know that Tanukis in Japanese folklore belong to a class of supernatural entities called yokai, and when discussing Tanukis as yokai, they're called Baki Danuki, but I'm going to keep calling them Tanukis because that's easier to say. Tanukis in folklore are known for being happy-go-lucky animals that love to cause mischief with their shape-shifting abilities. They can transform into virtually anything they want, kind of like the TX in Terminator 3. The only catch is that sometimes they need to have lotus leaves on their head to use this power, which is probably why Mario gets his Tanuki form after picking up the super leaf, at least in the later games. A Tanuki's favorite disguise is evidently that of a human monk, because monks are highly respected and people are generally less likely to call them out on any suspect behavior. This makes it easier for Tanukis to get their claws on food and alcohol both of which they enjoy in copious amounts. Identity theft is a risky biz though. There's one tale where Tanuki spends all day being pampered by a village that believed he was a famous monk, and when he tried to sneak away in the middle of the night with no one seeing, he was torn to shreds by a pack of wild dogs. In another story, a Tanuki goes so far as to impersonate a samurai's dead wife presumably to siphon off the man's large salary. When the samurai first sees his wife returned from the grave as beautiful as the day before she died and she beckons him to join her in bed with him, he almost loses his composure. But unable to forget the vivid memory of his wife's body burning to ash, he knew this had to be an imposter or a spooky ghost. So he stabs the impersonator three times in the chest only for her to vanish into thin air. The next morning, the samurai followed a blood trail through the keyhole of his house, and at the end of it was a dead, bloody tanuki with three stab wounds in its chest. This isn't the only occasion where a tanuki impersonates someone's dead wife, but the developers at Nintendo wisely chose to reference the creature's other favorite disguise, which is why when Tanuki Mario uses his invincible statue ability, he looks like a monk with a staff. 
specifically a monk known as Kushiti Garba, who people honored with statues in their homes. When the suit made its return in Super Mario 3D Land, though, his statue form was changed so he retained the appearance of a tanuki. The funny thing is, this is still accurate to Japanese lore because tanuki statues became widely popular in the 20th century when a potter named Fujiwara Tetsuso lined his street with handmade tanuki statues to honor the emperor, which he greatly appreciated. In addition to being adorable, these statues are used to let people know they should enter a place with a cheerful spirit, and the hope is they trick other tanuki into thinking one of their kind has already been there. When you look a little closer at the depiction, there's even more meaning behind it though. These big bulbous eyes are for surveying the world, while their floofy tails are for self-defense. They wear wide-brimmed hats to protect themselves from bad luck and bad weather, and in one hand, you'll see this guy's holding a bottle of sake, which symbolizes virtue, while in the other is a promissory note, symbolizing trust. The statues also have another attribute that deserves your undivided attention. They're absolutely ginormous balls. They're so big that I don't even have to look where I'm pointing. Just, I know in the general area, I'll be hitting it. Boom. Believe it or not, these bad boys are symbolic too. The family jewels represent wealth, but they also serve many vital purposes for the tanuki. When it's raining, tanukis use their scrotums as umbrellas. In combat, they can swing them around like wrecking balls or even disguise them to intimidate their enemies. They make for excellent hammocks and comforters, fishing nets, drum sets, and they can even use them to glide through the air. Those of you who've seen Pompoko, a movie I should clarify was made for children, will no doubt remember the infamous scene where the tanukis rain death and destruction on a battalion of cops using just their big old balls. And while I'm sure this raises a ton of questions in your mind, the first of which being, why? Unfortunately, I don't have all the answers. I don't think anyone does. Let's just all be thankful that Tanuki Mario uses his tail to fly, and that Tom Nook wears an apron. Now before we warp into the next section and explore the wide range of Tanuki tales, I want to shout out our longtime sponsor, Squarespace. Back in 1986, Mario didn't know the first thing about saving princesses, but that didn't stop him from slaughtering the King of Koopas and rescuing his bride-to-be. That's the attitude you've got to have when it comes to building your own website, and thanks to Squarespace, you won't need any extra lives or warps to get the job done. For over a decade, Squarespace has been dominating the DIY website industry, and when you look at their process, it's easy to see why. They have a giant library of award-winning website templates that suit your every purpose, and their intuitive drag-and-drop design tools allow even the least experienced computer user to make their site uniquely their own. Whether your goal is to sell your own merchandise, start a newsletter to keep your community informed, or treat your customers to a VIP experience with exclusive gated content, Squarespace can make your goals happen. And because they know how important a website is for the success of any business, Squarespace has an award-winning customer support team available 24-7 if you run into any problems. So if you want to join me and the thousands of mere mortals who didn't let their dreams stay dreams, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. There are a lot of tales I could have chosen to feature in this section, but I picked out three that I think are the best reflection of the wide range of Tanuki lore. That means a story that shows them as the hilarious, harmless tricksters that most people think of them as nowadays, and one where Tanuki's pranks cross the line into cold, calculated murder. Let's -a go. It's only appropriate for us to start with a quick nod to the earliest written story we have about Tanukis. Found in the Nihon Shoki, written in 720 CE in one of Japan's oldest history books, it includes a tale about a farmer's dog that caught and killed a Mujina and found a gemstone in its stomach. Mujina is another term used for the Japanese raccoon dog that's also known as a Tanuki. However, to make things more confusing, a Mujina is technically a Japanese badger with similar magical abilities as a Tanuki. Funnily enough, the supernatural Chinese fox, known as the Kitsune, was also mistaken for the Tanuki on occasion, which may be why Luigi wears a Kitsune suit when he gets the Super Leaf power-up. Now, for whatever reason, experts are comfortable assuming that in that story, Mujina was intended to mean Tanuki, making it the oldest written Tanuki tale but it's definitely not the most entertaining, which is why we're blazing past it. 
Our second story is one of the most popular Tanuki tales there is. In English, it's often called the Magic Tea Kettle, or some variation of that, but a more accurate translation of the title would technically be happiness bubbling over like a teapot. Honestly, the Magic Tea Kettle is catchier. In this classic Japanese folktale, we come across a junk man named Jinbei. He's in the middle of a hard day's work hauling junk from point A to point B when he comes across a group of boys bullying a little girl. The boys are holding the girl's doll just out of reach while calling her names and shoving her to the ground, so Jinbei steps in to tell them to cut it out. In the end, he doesn't have to do much. His shouts alone are enough to scare the boys into dropping the doll and running away. The only problem was he scared the girl off too, and she left her doll behind. Figuring that he might run into the girl some other time, Jinbei tosses the doll onto his junk cart and continues along his route, only to be stopped a few hours later by a Buddhist monk who asks the junk man if he happens to have a tea kettle for sale. You thought he was going to ask for the doll, didn't ya? That'd be weird. Jinbei tells the monk that he doesn't have a tea kettle on him, but he'll look through his inventory when he gets home. And sure enough, he finds one, so he throws it on his cart and heads back toward the monk. It's on the journey over that the tea kettle revealed its true nature. Its spout transformed into a snout, its handle into a tail, and its base into four furry legs. Naturally, the junk man was startled by the sudden change, but the little creature, which he recognized was a tanuki, told him to have no fear. The tanuki revealed that the little girl Jinbei saved earlier was itself in disguise, and when it took shelter in the house full of junk, it didn't realize Jinbei lived there. When the tanuki saw the doll on Jinbei's cart, it realized it was looking at its hero, and it told Jinbei that it would do whatever he needed to repay the favor. The junk man responded that the priest was going to pay him handsomely for a teapot, and now he didn't have a teapot to sell, so the tanuki reassured him. Man, I can totally be a teapot. Then Jinbei brought the furry little teapot to the priest who paid him handsomely for such a unique artifact. As Jinbei walked away with his profit, he was smiling ear to ear, thinking his troubles were finally behind him. But that night, when the monk tried putting his new teapot over the fire, he was scared half to death when it started screaming and transformed into an ugly little raccoon thing. The monk was so startled that he fell over and landed on his back, hard. Meanwhile, the tanuki had jumped off the monastery and disappeared into the forest surrounding them. The monk tracked Jinbei down and demanded his money back, plus a little something extra for the trouble. But the junk man didn't want to lose his profit. That's when the tanuki reappeared and told the monk they would find a way to make it right. After a lengthy discussion where they reviewed the skills each of them brought to the table, the answer was clear they would be street performers. The junk man would play music on the various instruments he recovered and repaired over the years, while the tanuki entertained spectators by doing stunts on a tightrope and transforming into various objects. With their powers combined, they were not only able to pay back the monk, but they made enough money to never have to haul junk or pull another scam as long as they lived. And that is the last story we're covering where the tanuki is a good guy. I promised you all some bloodshed, and you're gonna get it. Story number three is right up there with the darkest stories we've ever covered on this show. There's only a few that come anywhere close in my mind, specifically the original Little Red Riding Hood. The tanuki that appears in this story, which is called Kachi Kachiyama, isn't just a trickster, it's straight up evil. The tale begins during harvest season, when an elderly farmer catches a troublesome tanuki while it's eating the tasty scraps he left out for his beloved pet hare. He strings the tanuki up and leaves him there, hanging in the tree, while he goes back to work with the intention of making some delicious tanuki stew that evening. Fast forward to that evening, and the farmer returns home after spending the last few hours tending to his fields, and he's delighted to see that his wife has gone ahead and prepared the stew for him. He inhales its delicious aroma and wastes no time pouring himself a bowl, and then another, and then another. It'd been a while since he had tanuki to eat, and this was by far the best he'd ever tasted. It wasn't until he finished his last bite that his wife finally sat down next to him, and he realized that he didn't save any for her. He was about to apologize when she reached out and gently placed her hand on his arm, and as he sat there, feeling grateful for the woman who made him feel as loved and lucky as the day they first met all those years ago, he saw her hand start to shrink. But it wasn't just shrinking. 
It was sprouting short brown furs, and her fingernails turned to claws. Within the span of a few moments, the farmer's wife had completely transformed. This wasn't the woman he fell in love with. It was the tanuki he had tied to the tree, and when it opened its mouth, it asked him one horrible question. Did you enjoy your soup? It turns out that while the farmer was working away, his wife, who always had too much of a soft spot for critters in trouble, saw the tanuki hanging there and couldn't resist it begging for help. The tanuki told the wife that if she let him down, he'd help her cook dinner for her husband, then let her tie him back up again. And technically, he was only half lying. To his credit, he didn't run away immediately after he was cut free, but that's only because revenge takes time. The tanuki followed the woman into her house, and the moment she turned her back to him, he cracked her over the head with a pestle, and she dropped dead. Next, he grabbed the sharpest knife he could find in the kitchen and proceeded to chop his rescuer into little pieces. Next, he went ahead and tossed her good bits into the stew that she was preparing to cook him in. Which means this poor farmer devoured not one, not two, but three bowls of his lovely wife. And after he collapsed to the ground in a bumbling heap of horror, sadness, and disgust, the tanuki let out a long, satisfied laugh and let himself out the door. Now, as horrible as that is, you'll be happy to hear that's not the end of the story. In his arrogance, the tanuki completely forgot about the farmer's pet rabbit who vowed to get revenge. And the rabbit did it in the best way possible, by befriending his enemy and subtly making his life hell over an extended period of time. Over the next few days, the hare would drop a beehive on the tanuki, treat his open wounds with hot peppers, and worst of all, when the tanuki was carrying a bundle of wood on his back, the rabbit lit it on fire, giving him some nasty burns. It's actually from this incident that the story gets its name. When the tanuki hears the wood crackling, he asks what the sound is, and the rabbit replies, it is Kachi Kachiyama, Fire Crackle Mountain. We are not far from it, so it is no surprise that you can hear it. Funnily enough, this story's ending is also referenced in a Mario game. The tanuki challenges the hare to a boat race, and the hare carves his boat out of a fallen tree, while the tanuki sculpts his out of mud. On race day, the two start out evenly matched, but the mud boat starts dissolving in the water. And when the tanuki cries out to the hare for help, the hare reveals his true identity as the farmer's friend. He declares the tanuki deserves to die for the horrible crimes he committed against the couple. Then he beats him over the head with an oar, sending his fat, unconscious body sinking into the darkness of the lake. Now to those wondering how this could possibly be referenced in a Mario game, that's a fair question. But if you've played Mario Sunshine, you may remember that in the Noki Bay area, there's a big fat tanuki who rents out mud boats for free. And if the boats are on the water too long or get hit with something, they sink just like in the story. In my opinion, the Tanuki's punishment was totally justified, but what do you think? Should the hare have pulled them out of the water, or would the petty Tanuki just use that as an opportunity to send them both to the bottom with his big heavy balls? Leave your opinions in a comment down below. If you enjoyed this episode and felt like you learned a little something, make sure you sacrifice a like to the algorithm gods, and those who want to learn more about how folklore and myth influence pop culture even to this day, hit that subscribe button. I post reels every weekday but Thursday, which is when I post deep dives like this one. I'll see you all again next week when we revisit a series of mine that's been neglected for over a year, Nursery Rhymes Explained. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first.